Yes. Ready to get into the Word of God? Yes. Jeremiah, that's not the book we're turning to, it's a verse I'm going to quote. Jeremiah 15 says, your words were found, and I ate them, and they were the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. I mean, we're supposed to, we're supposed to eat the Word of God, right? By the way, um, Pastor Andy took me and my wife out to dinner for my birthday Thursday night. The best food that I've ever had on the planet. It's called a Kraft Steakhouse in LA. It's amazing, amazing. Uh, we were talking about what is it going to be like when we get to heaven, and how many know the food is going to be amazing there and no calories at all. Nobody's going to be fat, overweight. We're going to have like 1% body fat. And as amazing as that meal was on Thursday night, we're going to dive into a better meal. We're going to dive into the Word of God. So grab your copy of the Word of God and turn to the book of Luke chapter 8. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Luke chapter 8, verses 28. I don't know. We're going to read about 10 verses or so. You doing well? Yes. Come on, are you doing well? Yes. I've been doing this like, uh, I've been preaching now about 30 years, and I can tell in a service when it's kind of like a little, Ugh. I'm feeling that right now. So am I... Am I feeling something that's not there or am I feeling like, Ugh. okay, it must be me then. So would you pray for me? Yes. All right, extend your hand this way. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for our time together. And I pray for our time together in the word of God. Help my voice. Give me energy and passion to communicate what you want me to communicate. It's in your name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. I feel better. I feel better. All right, Luke chapter 8. I'm at a week number 11 in our series. I've been really honestly enjoying our series and just looking at the life of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, how many were here last Sunday for the message? And great, great. And uh, they had to go through the storm. And the reason why they had to go th get through the storm is to get to the other side. And, and a couple weeks ago when I was studying both passages of Scripture, I was excited about the storm passage. But i got to be honest, I think I'm a little more excited for this passage that lays in front of us today. Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Do you have your copy of God's Word? Yes. And uh, this particular story is, I'm going to look at it in the book of Luke, but it is also found in the book of Matthew and the book of Mark. John, for whatever reason, decided to keep this out of the Gospels, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the exact same account. Here's the cool thing about reading it in different books and translations. Sometimes you get certain things that Matthew says that Luke leaves out. Luke leaves out. Sometimes Mark says something that, that Matthew and Luke uh, leave out. So I'm going to have you look up at the screen a little bit through the sermon to get you a different perspective just to save us some time. And this is going to be a really simple outline and a simple time together. But let me tell you um, how the service is going to end. You ready? Doesn't it bother you when people tell you how the movie is going to end or how the game is going to end? But I'm going to tell you up front how the, uh, the service is going to end. And uh, we've been praying and believing God for some big things. So after the first and the last service, we're, we just did an altar call. That just means people are going to get up out of their seat and come forward. And uh, I don't know, in the first service, maybe 100 people that came forward. And in the second service, we had probably three to 400 people, probably at least half of the adults were, I mean, just like filled the stay at the front and all the way kind of down the aisles and God was doing a marvelous work. And those are the times where we, you wish you only had one service so you can just go to like two or three or four o'clock. But because you guys were waiting to get a parking spot and get in here, we had to kind of chop it off, but it was powerful. Turn to somebody and say it was powerful. And God was setting some people free. And I believe, do you believe this, that God's not a respecter of persons and wants to do the same thing in the, his favorite service, the third, as he did in the other two services. All right. So get your heart ready. And uh, remember, you have a job to do. Your job is to sit up straight and to take some notes and to say amen and preach it and hallelujah and all that good stuff. And I'll do the best that I could do. But you got to have a receptive heart, okay? So here we go. Three things. Uh, point number one, write this down in your notes. First of all, I want to talk about the plan of Satan. The plan of Satan. Say it with me. The and that's found in Luke uh, chapter uh, 8, verses 26 through 29. Say it again with me. What's point number one? And uh, so grab your Bible, and uh, I'm going to be reading out of the NIV translation. Verse 26 says, they sailed to the, to the, look at your Bibles. What does it say? They sailed to the, underline that word, region. How many believe every single uh, uh, word in the Bible is really important? So I'm going to come back to that word right, th right there. It's really important. So they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. Okay, let's just stop there. Look this way. I'm going to break this down if, I, if, I, if you'll let me. Number one, I want to talk about demonic activity. And how many believe that there is a demon? There are demons and there's a devil in hell, right? And uh, he comes to do three things. He comes to steal kill, 
You're like, ex can you be more exact? Like steal what? Steal everything, your reputation, your character, your marriage. Steal, kill, kill everything, your hope, your dreams, your, your, your future, your kids, your finances, your health. He wants to ste uh, steal, kill, and everything, everything. He, he's not like this little, little guy in a little cute outfit, little red pitchfork. And No, no, he's like, he wants to divide your marriage. He wants to destroy your kids and your reputation and your future. And that's what he comes to do. And, but here's what I've discovered. I've been saved since 1985. And I've discovered in the body of Christ, there's typically, there's typically two extremes that I have seen over the years as it relates to the devil and demons. Ready? Now, the first extreme is that some people overemphasize uh, the demonic and uh, demons, right? And uh, so I was a youth pastor many years ago. I think I was late to church on a Sunday morning. And uh, I mean, there's always a couple people in the church that are just like a little out there. They never come to the third service. They always go to the other three services. But do you know what I'm talking about? Like everything's spiritual, and, right? And so I had a flat tire in my car, and I ran over a nail or something. And she, a lady said, hey, you're late. And I said, yeah, I, I got a flat tire. And she looked at me, pointed her finger right at me, and she says, you need to take authority over that demon of flat tire and rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I was like, no, I just ran over a nail is what happened. So relax, relax. And some people, I'm, I'm not this guy where like there's a, a demon behind every bush and, and we want to blame the devil for a lot of things. I think sometimes we blame the devil and demons for, for bad decisions that we make. And, uh, and so under, uh, overemphasized for sure. And remember, when I got saved, it was, uh, was popular. And if you're young, you're not going to know what this is. But remember the record albums, the black record albums? Kids are like, they have no idea what I'm talking about. But they're record albums. And when I got saved in 1985, the, 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 the big thing was that if you were to take like a Black Sabbath album and you were to play it backwards, remember? That it would sound like demons and stuff. So like, it would say stuff. And I'm like, you don't even have to play it backwards. Just play Black Sabbath forward and it's demonic, right? So... It was called backward masking. And uh, so overemphasize. Some people, for sure, they overemphasize the demonic. Here's the other side of it, though, ready? Underemphasize. And you need to know that the, that the devil is real and demons are real. And uh, check this out. Ephesians 6, the Bible says in verse 12, we, do not, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Check this out. It says we're not fighting against people. I know you think your husband is your issue. He's not your problem. You're like, man, I wish my wife would get her act together. She's not your problem. Not your kids, your coworker, your boss, your parents. No, we're fighting Demonic influence in high places that's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. Here's a question. Can, because in the text here, this guy was demon-possessed, can a non-Christian be de uh, demonically possessed of the devil? And the answer is what? Yes, yes. Again, I don't chase demons around, but I've seen in the course of pastoring now for almost 30 years, it'll be 30 years next January, I've, seen, I've probably had five or six encounters with someone that's been possessed by the devil. Like legit, like 14-year-old like girl, when I was up at camp, she was acting up in the back of the service, and my sister-in-law said, I don't know, something's wrong with this girl. So me and a couple of youth leaders took her into a back room, and she's just like, she's like this tall little 13, 14-year-old girl, and, and uh, she was convulsing and, and loud, and, and what's your name? And she gave some, like, crazy name. It wasn't her name, and because uh, that's what demons do. They, they take on a new name and a new identity, and, and she was convulsing. We were praying for her in the name of Jesus. You've seen this, Manny, at camp. And, and you pray for people, and you hear voices. Like, 14-year-old girl, we heard, get away from me, like that. Sounded like a 50-year-old 50, 50 man. You cannot, you cannot tell me that I wasn't there. You cannot tell me that she was not demonically possessed. I'm telling you, she was. And we prayed for her, and we said, in the name of Jesus, we cast that out. We plead the blood of Jesus. And I'll tell you, after about 20 minutes of taking authority over that demonic spirit, that girl was cast out. And where, where she was sitting there convulsing and frothing at the mouth, she sat there in her rightful place. I'm telling you, I witnessed the whole thing. So... Five or six times the power of Jesus Christ. So can a Christian be possessed of the devil? No. But they can be oppressed. Better word is influenced. So can I go down that line? Can I talk about this for a second? Is this a safe place? I'm going to try over here. You guys are looking at me.
influenced, oppressed. Can Christians, this section, can Christians be oppressed? Yeah. How does that happen? Well, music, horror movies. I was at the movie theater a couple of years ago, and there was this really demonic movie, and we ran into a family from our church. And they're like, hey, what are you going to see? And we're like, oh, we saw some PG. And I said, what are you guys going to see? And they're like, we're, it was the, like, what are you doing there? Why are you going to that kind of movie? Because you're opening up your spirit and your heart to demonic influence. My mom's funeral, I mentioned my mom passed away at 59. I went to the funeral and the priest got up there and I was on the front row right here and he said, hey, what you need to do is the family, you need to pray to your mother every day and you need to speak to her every day and although she's dead, you need to speak to her. I'm like, that's not in the Bible anywhere. You do not speak to the dead. You do not have seances of any kind. You don't look at astrology. Why are we looking at astrology? Why are we going to a psychic to tell us something that they cannot tell us? I have a book right here that tells me what my future is. God says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to give you a future and a hope. Well, we, kind of, we were at a party and stuff. We were just kind of talking, and then one thing led to another, and we were looking at, like, horoscopes and astrology. Stop doing that. Stop doing it. I'm shocked at some of the movies that we go to. Some of the tele, You don't even have to go to a movie anymore. It's a television show. Do you know some of the stuff that's on TV as it relates to language, sex, and some of these demonic shows out there? That would have been outlawed 20 years ago. Now we're letting our kids watch some of this stuff. What are we doing? I, you say, well, what could we watch? I'll bet you all the shows that we should watch could probably fit on a post-it note. Max. Five shows max. We're just like, whatever, we're just like, anything. Do you know what your kids are watching? Do you know what you're, they're listening to? Some of the foul rap music, some of the foul heavy metal music. I'm telling you, you're opening up your home to demonic spirits. And they might not be possessed by the devil. I'm preaching, right? I'm telling you, I've seen this. They could be influenced by demonic activity, and it's an ugly thing. Satan is powerful. Someone say powerful. So you got to be really, really careful. Check out verse 27. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes. He ran around the town naked. Or he, he didn't live in a house, but he lived in the tombs. One translation says he lived in the cemetery. It's a dead place. Look at this picture up here. Here's what a tomb would have looked like in Jesus' time. So this guy ran around naked, possessed by the devil, and he lived in dead places. Mark Chapter 5, verse 3 through 5 says the same thing. It says, this man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with the, not even with the, not even with the chain. Although he was chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to, what's the word there? Subdue him. The word subdue means to control. Do we have anybody in the room here that's engaged? Engaged, anybody engaged or hoping to get engaged? Wanting to get married, yes, yes, wanting to get married, great. So I just want to warn you. <laughs> Sucker. You got to wait till you hear the illustration before you raise your hand. No, okay. You just got to make sure that the guy that you're going to marry, you got to make sure that he's under control. That his anger is under control. That his temper is under control. That his attitude is under control. Because if you think, well... Once we get married, then he's going to kind of shape up. No, it'll get worse when you get married. You better make sure that brother is under control now. Do not take the next step with him. Guys, where's my guys at? And before you get married to her, you better make sure she's under control. Because I've seen, I heard about people in our church throwing stuff at one another. Her attitude, her anger is out of control. You better make sure her shopping's not out, under control right now. I'm telling you, that credit card... Ching, 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 ching. You better, I'll tell you, it's really scary when somebody's out of control. And the Bible says that chains on his hands and feet could not control him. It goes on to say in Mark 5, and he would, he would be in the hills and he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Isn't it interesting? The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes, nothing new under the sun. So we thought years ago when we heard about kids cutting themselves, we're like, this is a new thing. No, this guy was cutting 2,000 years ago. Naked, running wild, possessed by the devil, cutting himself with stones. See, if the enemy can get us early, if the enemy can get an eight-year-old little girl early and she can come to the conclusion that she's not loved and have these insecure thoughts about herself, and if he can get her early, cutting herself. No, it's self-mutilation. 
And if the enemy can get a, a boy at nine or 10 to get addicted to pornography and feel bad about himself or get molested by someone and, and it's, self, it's cutting, this goes back 2,000 years ago, it's not a new thing. Think about this. This is not a joke. Think about the conversations you've had to yourself. Think about the lies you, I've told myself. I can never pastor church. I can never, like, that's the enemy, isn't it? And we, think about the times we've lied to ourselves and the conversations we've had. And the enemy wants to trick you and I to self-destruction. So this guy was possessed of the devil, running around naked, and he was cutting himself. I want you to see, though, Matthew chapter 8, verse 20, they were so violent that nobody could pass that way. Now, listen to this. So this guy was running all around naked, chained, hand and foot, but nobody could keep him in the chains. So he was running through the, but it didn't say, it, it goes on to say that, listen, it wasn't just that the demons were going after the man, ready for this? He was going after the territory. He was going after the region. Remember I had you underline that verse? He's going after the region. Listen, parents, he doesn't just want you, he wants your kids. He wants your grandkids. He wants to bind them at an early age before they come to life in Christ, before they get saved, before they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Check it out. He's not just going after you. He's going after your region, your work, your school, your kids, your grandkids. You got to wake up. This is a serious thing. Like this is such a sad message. No. We're going to get the good news in just a second. So we have an enemy, he's real, he's got a plan, right? Let me just say this, I uh, probably in my 53 years, don't clap, I'll be 54 tomorrow. In my, I said don't clap or, okay, so in my, I think I, I was thinking about my office, I probably got in maybe four or five fights in my life. This is like elementary all the way through high school. How'd you do? I won every one, are you kidding me? <laughs> no, it's probably 50-50. I don't, I, I love watching UFC and boxing, but I would not want to get in the octagon. I'm a lover, not a fighter. You too? Yeah. So I'd rather like talk it out. I'd rather pray it out. I, let's, let's not fight. Um, neighbors on one side of our house, I'm good with you. You can decorate your house how you want it. You can paint it the color you want. I'm not going to mess with you. My, Awesome neighbors on this side. I'm, you can paint your house blue. I'm not going to say a word. I'll stay out of your business. I don't care what kind of landscaping you have. You, listen, you stay out of my house. I'll stay out of yours. But the second, like in the middle of the night, you come over the fence into my backyard, <laughs> we're going to be fighting. So if you, if you try to break into my house and mess with my wife, we are going to town. If you're, if you're going to mess with my kids... You might think I'm only 5'10", whatever. I'm telling you, I will go, I'll go psycho on you. Where, where are the mothers at in the house with kids, right? You do not want to mess with a mother. I know she looks all timid and shy and gentle. She will jack you up in Jesus' name. You know what I'm talking about? So listen, you stay on your side. We're good. You come over to my side of the house in the middle of the night. Come up the stairs. We are going to death. And it's not going to be like a dignified fight. I'm going to go postal on you. I'm going to go girly girl on you. I will pull out your hair. I'll bite your face off. I will. I'll. Come on, get your dukes up right now. Come on, get your hands up. Let's go. So I want to, I want to know, are you, are you fighting for your family? Are you just like, well, it is what it is. Our marriage is what it is. Are you fighting for your marriage? Are you fighting for your health? The enemy's trying to take you out. Fight for your health. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He is the great physician. Well, I guess, it, I guess it is what it is. Everybody else's kids are falling away from Jesus. I guess ours will too. Forget that. Nehemiah chapter 4 says, fight for your family. Doesn't matter what the doctor said. Fight for your health. The enemy has a plan, but let me know that God's plan is always greater and bigger. Which brings me to point number two. Ready? I got to calm down. I got one more service to preach. Number two, the power of Jesus. Amen. So you thought it was just going to be bad news, the plan of Satan. No, no, the power of Jesus. Amen. So this guy was possessed. He's cutting himself. He's running around naked. But, all of God's people said, but, Amen. there's one person that can change the situation. Amen. We have a gal in our church. She's an amazing person. She was here in the last service. Beautiful, beautiful, inside and out. Just found out that 
she has a mass in her brain. So she was sitting on the front row. They were here in the last service right there. Why? Because when you're desperate, you want to sit up front and you, listen. When you go through something difficult, when you're possessed, when you're oppressed, when you're, you just lost your job, when there's a health issue, when there's a family crisis, isn't it funny? Everybody comes back, oh, I got to go to church, I got to go to church, right? Because God will make a difference in your life. That's the reason why. And in those difficult, dark times, what you don't need is like cutie pie Jesus. I just need like a, I need a gentle Jesus. I need a, like a fish on the back of my car, Jesus. I need jewelry around my neck, Jesus. No, you don't need a timid, shy, gentle Jesus. You need a powerful Savior and a mighty God. Because who else is going to change this guy around? And who else is going to change your situation and my situation around except for the person of Jesus Christ? So how many are grateful that we have a great big God? Come on, let's all declare it by faith. I got a great big God. I got a great big God. I declare that, that there is a plan of the enemy, but my Jesus is more powerful. Check this out. The Bible says in verse 30, verse 30, Jesus asked him, what is your name? The answer, legion. That's actually 6,000 foot soldiers. 6,000. Don't think for a second that the enemy and the demonic realm is not systematic and organized. It's like 6,000 marching soldiers. 6,000 Demons, at least, are inside of this guy. So Jesus says, what's your name? Legion replied, because many demons had gone out, gone into him. Yeah, thousands of them have gone into him. Verse 31 and verse 32. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. Matthew just says that all Jesus said, or Mark says, all that Jesus said was go. That's it, just one word. And the demons left this guy and went into 2,000 pigs. Okay? Just one word. Someone say one word. The demons begged Jesus to let them go. When the demons came out of the man, verse 33, they went into the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was, and was drowned. 2,000 of them. But I was thinking about this. So the demons were in one man creating havoc in a region God gave those demons permission to leave the one man to go into the 2,000 pigs. The 2,000 pigs basically committed suicide. I want you to think for a second. 2,000 demons took out 2,000 pigs, but those 2,000 demons couldn't take out this one guy. Think about, I want you to think about, what did this guy carry his entire life? Think about all that you carried. All that you've carried in your life, some of you got molested, some of you got abused, some of you, multiple divorces. I, I really believe this with all my heart. The enemy tried to get some of you at an early age. Some of you were supposed to die in the crib. Some of you got molested as, as 8, 9, 10, 11-year-old kids, and the enemy thought he had you. But check it out, you are a sitting miracle of the glory of God. And so the demonic world couldn't take you out, couldn't take him out. Why? Because of the power of Almighty God. So in verse uh, 10 of Mark chapter 5, it says, And he begged Jesus again not to send him out to that area. So Jesus said, Go, I give you permission. The enemy has a plan, but praise God, there is more power, 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that's in me than he, the enemy that's in the world. So I don't have to be afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of demons or the devil or anything. Listen, my God is greater. And Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 says, here it is, look at this. Finally, be strong in the Lord. That's it. Just say, I just feel so weak all the time. I know, because you're trying to live in your own strength. I feel powerless in my marriage. I know you're trying to do marriage in your own strength. Finally, be strong in who? And and if you feel weak, that's an awesome sign, by the way. So when I am weak, then I am. Say, God, I can't do this. I can't, I can't pastor. Like, I honestly, I can't pastor this church where it needs to go. I don't have enough wisdom and eloquence. I don't, I'm just not that gifted. God's like, it's okay. I knew, I knew that when I called you. It's not about you, Steve. Can't do this marriage. Can't raise my kids. Can't do this job. It's okay. When I am weak, I am strong. Be strong in the Lord. You know, we live in a very cordless generation, and, and your phone might last you all day long. Teenagers, it lasts like 30 minutes before you have to plug in. <laughs> but it might last all day long, but eventually you have to charge it. How many of you 
fill up your gas tank once a year. And if you, live in, if you work in L.A. or anything, you're probably going to fill up two times, right? Now, listen, Ephesians 5.18 says, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a, in the Greek, it's a constant thing, be being filled. Not, you don't just go to the gas station one time and that allows you to drive for two years. No, you got to go to the gas station all the time to fill up. Living in this world, you come to church, how many feel, you come to church, you're like, man, I feel awesome. And then you walk out of the room and uh, you get in your car and you get in an argument. And, and then by like Sunday night, Monday morning at work, you're just like, oh, I got to go to first Wednesday. And uh, how many of you got, we got to be constantly filled with the Holy Spirit because this culture living in this world drains the life out of you, right? So be filled with the Holy Spirit. The enemy has a plan, but Jesus has got greater power. Amen? Here's the third thing I want you to look at. Number three, something I notice is the different perspectives in the text. The different, write it down, perspectives. How do you spell that? It's coming on the screen. Some would say perspectives. All right, ready? Verse 34. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they, set, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right. I love these, I love these uh, shows, like Extreme Makeover. Like they'll take an old house, and then they renovate it. I love the before and the after. Anybody like that? I love that. Somebody lost two or 300 pounds before and after, before and after. Check this out. This, this happened. This happened. This guy was running around naked, living in, he, he was affecting a whole region, living in a cave, and then God just spoke a word, said, go. All the demons are out of him. The Bible says here in the text that this guy who was possessed of the devil was sitting there in his right mind. It says he got dressed, so he, he took a bath, he took a shower, and, and when they saw him, they're like, dude, this is crazy. It's the way I felt up at camp. 30 years ago when I saw the girl saying one in, in an old voice, and then just sitting there so calmly. So you would think after the guy gets delivered, the whole town is like, awesome. Let's do like a three-night healing service. Jesus put on a conference for us. We don't want to leave. So here's the two perspectives I saw in the text. Number one, I want you to see the crowd or the city, the region. You would have thought one guy doing a good thing with good results would have fired the city up. But what happened? They saw the guy there dressed in his right mind and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Verse 37, here it is, first perspective. Then all the people. Everybody? There wasn't one person that said, no, no, Jesus, we want you to stay. No, all the people. How did that go down, by the way? You got like thousands of people. Hey, uh, Jesus did, did an amazing miracle. He just delivered this guy. So thumbs up, we want Jesus to stay for a couple more days and do like a revival service. Thumbs down, we want him to leave. Okay, everybody vote at the count of three. Everybody, one, two, three. The whole town's like, no, we want him to leave. So here's the first perspective. Ready? Are you, are you like the crowd? Like, we don't mind coming to church. I just don't want to be like one of them. So I see they'll, they'll dance like on the front row. I'll, 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 I like coming, but I don't care how many times you talk about tithing, I'm not going to do it. I'll come on Sunday morning once in a while if it fits into my daily, weekly activities, but I would never be somebody that's going to take a class or go to a first Wednesday or fast or go on a mission trip or anything like that. I just want cozy, comfortable, build a Jesus. Do you know in, in our church, in our four services, we don't have anybody in, in this service, but in the other three services, we have what I want to call spectators. So I'm just wondering if maybe I should talk to the ushers and greeters that when when the spectators come in, maybe we just hand out like buckets of popcorn and give them a soda and stuff and maybe like some bonbons. How about some Skittles? Says, so, hey, hey, you just come and don't like watch a show and stuff. So we might a little pop, you want butter on your popcorn or not? You want, I, I just think a lot of times people come to church, to part, they spectate. They're, they're, they're like this. They're like the Olympic judge at the, you know, the Olympics. So the guy does the routine and we, they hold up like on a scale of one at seven. And we, don't, we don't do that like... You wouldn't hold up a sign like that because you would offend me. But in our minds, we're like, eh, it was all right. 
It's like four. I'll give it a four. He was really funny last week, and I brought a friend this week, and he better be good, and it was, it was okay. Four. That was a cool song, but I don't know, it's a, like the lights and stuff, I don't really, eh. I like the other girl that sang last week. I'm going to give her a six. Six. And we come to church, and we, instead of participating, we spectate. Let me tell you, the devil does not give a rip that you come to church and spectate. You can have your opinion. I think this. I think we should do that. I think. Well, grab your popcorn, put some butter on it, and you can still sit there and spectate. Here's when the devil gets really nervous when you start participating. When you stand on your feet and you shout and you clap and you lift your hands and you take notes and you contend for the power of God to do something different in your life, then he gets nervous. Then he breaks out in hives. Then he gets super anxious because now you've gone from a spectator to a participator and participators make all the difference in the world. Someone asked you a question. Do we just come to church on Sunday to spectate? Are we like the crowd? We, we want a little bit of Jesus, but not too much. I don't want to be one of those lunatics for Jesus. Now, this guy went from a maniac, we're going to find out, to a missionary. So there's the first perspective. I just, I want a little bit of him, but I don't want to go crazy. Here's the second perspective, ready? The man. The first perspective is the crowd. The second one is the man. Verse 37, all the people of the region of the garrisons asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So we got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with them, but Jesus sent him away. One of the translations says Jesus got into the boat and the guy tried to get in the boat with him. We're going. He's like, no. Why are you getting into my boat? That would be like after the service if I, my wife and I got in my car and I'm pulling in the back seat and they're like, I, what are you doing in my back seat? Get out of there. That's weird. Get out of my car, right? So the guy's like, we're going, we're going. Jesus is like, no, 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 I want you to stay there. Ready? Sometimes God gives us the faith to go. Sometimes God gives us the boldness and the courage to stay. Because the demons affected the territory, God needed somebody to impact the territory. Ready? This is so good. This is so good. Ready? Return, verse 39. Go home and tell how much God has done for you. It would, I wish we had time right now. I'd just love for like 25 people to stand and say, hey, what has God done for you? We don't have time to do that. We have another service. But it would be awesome. Wouldn't it be awesome? Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over, all over, all over town how much Jesus had done for them. Ready for this? Check this out. In the same translation, in the same translation, the Bible says in Mark chapter 5, verse 20, so the man went away and began to tell in the, look at this word, in the Decapolis, Deca, Deca. It's where we got our English word decade. It's where we get the number 10. So Luke just says, hey, go back to your town. But this, trend, th th this says he went to 10 other towns. He didn't just go to Oxnard. He's all, no, we're going to go to Oxnard and Ventura and Camarillo and Santa Paul. By the way, do you know there are 10 cities in Ventura County? So God just is looking for somebody to say, hey, will you not take my word, not just to Oxnard, not just to Camarillo, but somebody go to Santa Paula, somebody go to Fillmore, somebody go to Westlake Village, somebody go to Newberry Park and Thousand Oaks. And I need, I need my, the good news of Jesus Christ to impact the entire county of Ventura. There are 885, I think, thousand people that live here. Praise God for what he's doing in our church, but there are so many more people to reach. Can I be honest? Yeah, we want you to be honest. When I got to the end of my study, I, I, here's the decision I made. I said, Steve, you gotta be more like Jesus in looking for people in and outside of the church that are possessed and oppressed of the devil and be, be sensitive and compassionate and caring to them. And so I, I kept seeing myself as Jesus in the text. But then I noticed that in me, in me, there's a crowd mentality. Because we have so many new people that come to our church. So there's, even as a pastor, I, like, okay, worship is going to be this long. 
We're not going to do anything too crazy because we have new people kind of checking things out and they're, they're seeking. And man, if we get too many people dancing on the front, they're going to think we're weird. And so I don't say it out loud, but I, I think in my mind, we just got, let's play it safe, Jesus. So we'll give you this much latitude, but stay inside the box. And I kept seeing less of Jesus in me and I saw more of the crowd in me. And if that's not even worse, I saw more of the man in me. Not that I'm possessed. Some of you think I might be, but I'm not, I promise. <laughs> but, ready? But I have my chains too. Oh, you don't have any dead places in your life? You don't have any insecurities in your life. You don't have any identity issues in your life. You don't keep running back to dead places and spaces and relationships and it's just me, huh? I mean, we all have chains in our life. Oh, you, you want me to clear the church out? All right, I'll just talk about the external things like gossip. I need to talk to him. She said, come to church. I'm going to get better tomorrow. Same thing happens at work or at school. Lying, cheating, pornography. This is just a, oh, that's none of me. I'm, I'm clean. Okay, then I would just go right to the internal things that we can't see about you. Your insecurity, your lust, your pride. We all have chains. And I kept seeing in me the crowd and the man. And I just want to know, are there any chain breakers in the house? Now it's time to have church. The Spirit of God is in this place. Sometimes we hear a message like this and we're like, I wish, man, I wish my husband would have came today. And my brother really needed to hear, no, this, this is for you. This message is for me. I don't care if you're eight years old or 85 years old or anywhere in between. I don't care if you're black or white, male or female, Hispanic, Asian. How I many we all have our chains? God wants to set you free. God's gonna do a deep work. I sense it in my spirit right now. You gotta do your part though. Yeah, but if I come forward, what are people gonna think? Who cares? Who cares? Do you think the demon possessed guy was really concerned about how he looked to other people? No, I gotta get to Jesus. Doesn't matter if you're on my staff, you're a pastor in our church and you've been dealing with the chain. I, I believe, listen, I believe this by the spirit of God. He's gonna break fear over some people. He has not given you a spirit of fear, power, love, and a sound mind. Some of you have been dangling with drugs and alcohol and gambling and horror movies and astrology and tarot cards. You need to lay it at the altar today. Insecurity, depression, I believe it's gonna break in Jesus' name. Yeah, but I'm on medication. Hey, if you gotta take medication, you gotta do what you gotta do. I went to a counselor, praise God for counselors. Jesus can do one, one word, go, and the demon has to go. I wanna to talk to my teenage girls. Do you know how loved you are by God? He loves you, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Stop listening to some stupid little 13 year old punk kid telling you something that's not true about your life. God loves you, doesn't matter how many followers you have, doesn't matter if you, doesn't matter anything about what anybody says at your school, it's a lie from the pit of hell. Any suicidal thought is broken in Jesus' name. I come against the enemy and I rebuke it in Jesus' name. Listen, it's a spirit, it's a spirit. And God's gonna set you free today. Right now, all over the building, would you get up out of your seat right now? Would you come forward and fill the front? I don't care why you're coming, what you're coming for, it doesn't matter, God's gonna set you free. Maybe you've never begun a relationship with Jesus, God is gonna save you. Come on, get out of your seat, come forward, move to the front. We're gonna pray for you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.